This is Dr. Paul Tomlinson from Compass Health Network, and I'm doing a continuing series aimed at inspiring hope and promoting wellness during these times we're living in and living through. This is part two of Unmasking the Psychology of Masks, where I want to continue to apply evidence-based psychology to the issue. Based on the best available scientific evidence, the CDC recommends that nearly everyone wear cloth face coverings in public settings, especially when other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. Why? Because cloth face coverings may help prevent people who have COVID-19 from spreading the virus to others. And because cloth face coverings are most likely to reduce the spread of COVID-19 when they are widely used by people in public settings. As I noted in episode one, this whole issue of wearing masks in our culture is not simple, really. And I think many have tried to make the matter much more simple than it actually is. Just do it, some say, and if you don't, then you're judged to be stupid or even evil. Let's dive more into the psychology of masks and try to better understand the resistance of some in hopes of overcoming that resistance and getting more to willingly participate in this large scale act of compassion, which is how I like to think of it. Okay, so in episode one, I talked about how human beings underestimate abstract threats, which is what COVID-19 remains for many, how we resist change based on our cost benefit assessments how conflicting messages early on may have caused a persistent misunderstanding of the benefits of wearing masks, and how role models and leadership have perhaps been lacking in some cases. I mentioned Dr. Robert Cialdini's work on persuasion and how we often look to others in order to determine what we should be doing, so-called social proof as a standard for our behavior. And that's where I want to pick it back up. Another very applicable idea from Cialdini's great work is the recognition that the stronger the sense of individualism in a culture, the stronger the resistance you can expect to authorities trying to establish new social norms. In our very independent-minded nation and communities, it seems many folks truly relish the chance to do the opposite of what they're encouraged to do, particularly when they don't understand or agree with a policy due to their political affiliation, etc. Now, speaking of individualistic versus collectivist societies, Certainly, a quick look around should convince you that we Americans are in the former camp, by and large. And this is a deep-seated reason why we face an uphill battle in achieving sufficient mask saturation. Anthropologists would likely point to the fact that in many countries, masks are a marker of morality. They are imbued with moral significance. They are the essence of pro-social behavior. Yes, you can think of that as roughly the opposite of antisocial behavior. I mean, think about it. In the U.S., masked figures are reflexively viewed as having a nefarious motive, even a criminal one. Think outlaws, anarchists, and generally bad guys. The idea here is that masks are deeply held psychologically, not to mean you're being community-minded and responsible, but that you're hiding something. Yet another reason why more people aren't yet wearing masks is that it's a new behavior, a change in behavior, something novel. Well, human beings are creatures of habit, and it takes a while to change a habit, even if you mentally and emotionally assent to it being the right thing to do. There's an old saying in organizational psychology, the only people who really love change are babies with wet diapers. I think there's a lot of truth to that. We are resistant to change in the main, and most of us have never ever had to wear a mask before, unless we were in a maternity ward or on Halloween, let alone for taking a run or going grocery shopping or whatever. Changing behavior takes a minute, so we might need to be a little bit patient. Maybe a little. Another reason is that misinformation and mistaken beliefs turn out to be very difficult to dislodge once they're ensconced in our brains. Our brains are amazing and beautiful, and they can also do us a great disservice if we're not careful. We like to think we are rational beings, and we certainly have the, the capacity to be so, but we're actually cognitive misers, as they say sometimes. Cognitive misers. I, I bet you think this is how you form beliefs or understandings. One, we hear something, for example, masks are ineffective because the virus is way smaller than the weave of the mask, like a, mos like a mosquito through a chain link fence. Two, we think about it, evaluate it rationally, seek evidence to determine if it's true or false, and only then, three, we form our belief or understanding. But it's not like that at all, usually. It usually goes something like this. One, we hear something. Two, we believe it to be true. 
and three, only later, maybe, given sufficient time or motivation, we think about it, evaluate it, and determine whether it's true or false. Suffice to say, our brains have evolved for efficiency rather than accuracy. We still form beliefs without vetting and critically evaluating them. And we maintain them very often, even in the face of credible, corrective information. Listen, our brains are not going to automatically update our false beliefs. That's something we have to be conscious of and make real efforts to do. Maybe it's no big deal, like believing that one human year equals seven dog years. It's not accurate, but most of us still do that math equation. But the bigger the stakes, the more dangerous the persistence of mistaken beliefs is. Like when we continue to believe widespread use of masks in concert with distancing won't slow or halt the progression of COVID. It has worked in other countries. It will work here, if we work it. Perhaps one of the most basic reasons folks aren't wearing masks yet, and they're reacting so strongly to the prospect of mandates, is the simple social psychology concept of reactance. Reactance just means that we have a strong tendency to dig in our heels, object, or push back when we perceive our freedom of action threatened. Many people see masks, and mandated masks in particular, as a forfeiture of their freedom. And that is a prescription for pushback. But even though reactance is ubiquitous and probably instinctual, you have to admit it's not the most mature or evolved human response. It might be more helpful to make ourselves arrest the reactance when it is activated and more critically evaluate whether we're objecting on principle or if it's just because we are dispositionally contrarian. We're just contrary by disposition. All this to say, rebellion is natural and expected when we are mandated by authorities to do anything. Did you ever hear the stories about how folks would cut the seat belts out of their cars in the early days of those mandates and laws? Hard to imagine now, right? We're kind of doing the same thing when we refuse masking or ridicule the very thought of it. What do we need? In therapy, we would call it reframing, and we need a big one here. We need to reframe from forfeiting freedom or draconian compulsion to seeing it as an act of compassionate solidarity, as I mentioned. We're doing it to protect the most vulnerable, including ourselves. Wearing a cloth mask can stop seemingly healthy people from infecting others with coronavirus if they're not currently symptomatic. Just like I said, and others have said from the beginning of the pandemic, the why is important. This is love in action, love for self, love for others. And what's more important than that? Yet I understand and empathize with a desire to deny it, even flashes of anger and dismay when we see people in masks. Masks mean something is wrong, really wrong. Now, if you're paying attention, denial and anger are signs of grief. In fact, they're stages of the classic grief cycle. If we mask up, we are pushing past the denial that we're going to suddenly and painlessly go back to normal, so to speak. We're admitting that the world has tilted on its axis a bit and some things are really wrong. And we're grieving the loss of a way of life, our old way of life, which is simply gone, for the time being at least, and maybe for good. But that may not be all bad. Please come back and join me for the third and final installment of Unmasking the Psychology of Masks. We will turn from just considering resistance to talking about some of the intriguing underlying psychological factors that go along with this masking issue. <laughs>